One of the most familiar icons in central London is St Paul's Cathedral. Sir Christopher Wren's 17th century masterpiece has remained one of the city's enduring symbols. Now a recently completed facelift has given visitors the chance to see the magnificent interior with new eyes. From the floor to the top of the dome, it gleams in the sunlight. Latex was used to peel off the dirt on the walls and a portion of the old wall remains to contrast the new. One of the greatest challenges was accessing every single square centimetre of the wall face and none of the scaffolding could be done during the daytime for obvious reasons, so that all had to be done at night. Um, and the other challenge was just uh, keeping a, a team of craftsmen motivated when they have 15,000 square metres of stonework to clean. Um, uh, but I was blessed with a, with a great collection of people who um, were you know, motivated by the vision of what it could be like at the end. The paintings of the life of St Paul in the Whispering Gallery can now be clearly seen and once again form part of the glowing interior. 100 tonnes of scaffolding, 21 storeys high, was hung from the lantern in the top cone and lodged as a segment on the floor of the gallery. It was rotated as work proceeded. There are eight colossal scenes in the ceiling painting. It covers two and a half thousand square meters. Statues in the gallery and throughout the main floor were painstakingly steam cleaned with pressure jets. And the swords and drapes were repainted over originals covered up in earlier times. The St Mark mosaic had to be taken down and repaired because of vibration damage from the organ pipes. The spectacular result of brush cleaning the mosaics can be seen in the choir stalls. I think what's happened is actually quite breathtaking. And I think you see this building now, which is you know, one of the world's great buildings, um, restored in a way that perhaps even Christopher Wren never fully saw it. Because I think by the time the roof went on in Wren's day, it was already quite dirty. Christopher Wren's building is the fifth known cathedral built on the site, although the number is higher if every major medieval construction was included. The work was paid for with a £10 million private donation from the Fleming banking family. The cleaning of the exterior had already been completed before the interior clean was started. St Paul's 108 metre high dome was inspired by St Peter's Basilica in Rome. To balance the interior and exterior perspectives, there are actually three domes cushioned into each. The clock tower is on the west end of the cathedral. Besides its beauty, the building is one of the great Christian centres. Dozens of representations of Christ are on permanent display, but occasionally there are also temporary exhibitions. On show are four unusual representations of Christ by the Russian artist Sergei Chepik. Sergei's work contrasts the grandeur of much of the work in the cathedral. The truth that Christ brought to the world is not a sweet truth. It's not a cake with cream, though it's bread, it's blood. It's quite a severe truth. Some feel these paintings do have their place among the nearby tombs of the noble and great who also reside in St Paul's. So many presentations of Christ down the centuries have portrayed him as a Greek god, or they've wrapped him in what I would call shrouds of Renaissance piety. And I think as I read the Gospels, I find a figure who is very unsentimental, who is very confrontational, and who is compelling because he speaks the truth. Coming up, modern Moscow. Moscow has many famous landmarks, Red Square and St. Basil's, just to name two. Then there is the city's incredible history, revolution, war and reform, all within the past century. 
But modern Moscovites are writing their own history, and it is certainly not based on the old communist model. A Russian billionaire is building the world's most exclusive housing community, just one hour drive northwest of Moscow. The new estate with massive houses, averaging 1,000 to 2,000 square meters, rise above a line of newly planted trees. The homes, all individually designed by foreign architects, come with large indoor swimming pools and will cost around 30 million US dollars. Some resemble Scottish baronial mansions, while others come with fluted pillars and look like ancient Greek palaces. Thanks to Russia's economic boom, owning a suburban house is nothing novel to Moscow's growing elite. In recent years, gated communities with detached houses have sprung up all around the Russian capital. But the estate that is being built here, however, is set to dwarf all the existing ones in scale, price and beauty. The man behind the ambitious plan is Aras Agalarov. A billionaire businessman himself, Agalarov has visited most of the luxurious estates in the world and believes he can offer something better to his fellow Russian billionaires. Here we brought the best from the entire world together. We have the best designers for everything. For example, the man who designs the golf course for us wrote a handbook on golf called Cal. The people that work here with tractors are from all over the world, from Argentina, Portugal, Australia. We have specialists in how to shape a golf course. The waterfalls were going to be built by Americans, but I don't like American-style waterfalls, so I brought in experts from Australia. Sitting behind the wheel of a Land Rover that carries his name, Agalarov regularly drives around the vast area. Those who choose to buy a mansion in his fenced-off Agalarov estate will also be able to enjoy the luxury of a private golf course, sport complexes and a hotel for extra guests. This area here we will make green with artificial rivers. It will all be like over there. Agalarov says the total construction costs will be around 1 billion US dollars, but he estimates the total selling price at 3 billion US dollars. Make sure all goes according to plan. He inspects the progress of the work on a weekly basis. Agalarov expects there will be no problem finding buyers. Our estate will not be less. It will be even more beautiful than the ones I saw. That is the task I gave myself. Who the buyers will be is not a question. There will be so many buyers that it will be a problem for me to decide who to sell to. While Argalarov believes wealthy Russians will soon be fighting for the right to buy, the mansions are in stark contrast to the villages outside the gates of the estate. Left out by Russia's boom, most people living here don't even have running water. I need to herd my goats, but there is no space left. Everywhere are fences. It is all private property. 74-year-old Vera Emelianovna grew up in the village, but now lives with her daughters in Moscow. Each summer she returns to her small wooden house to tend her vegetable garden and enjoy the forests. The new neighbours on the other side of the field have brought unwelcome changes. They enclosed us and separated us from the forest. You see how bad it is. It is now forbidden to go to the forest. It feels like being in prison. Look, everywhere are fences. There are changes happening all around Moscow, and only time will reveal what its new landmarks will be. Yeah. 6928 Hollywood Boulevard may not immediately spring to mind as a landmark address, but when you say Grumman Chinese Theatre, most people know exactly what you mean. For over 80 years, movie stars have cemented their place in film history by performing a simple ceremony in Sid Grumman's legendary forecourt. As stars such as Brad Pitt from the movie Ocean's 13 was about to do, a selected few were added to the Parthenon of Hollywood mythology by writing their names in cement. There's always plenty of Hollywood whooping and cheers from the fans who always have to queue for their spots. Kit was joined that day by George Clooney, Gary Wycroft and Matt Damon. 
the ritual is to press their hands or feet, or sometimes their hooves, into wet cement, sign their name, often with a simple message. This ceremony took place close to the 80th anniversary of the first signing. Oh, thanks for coming out. I gotta say, I must say, if, uh, if I had to be on my hands and knees with three other guys, I can't think of better guys in the world. I mean that. Since the famous theatre restaurant opened in May 1927, there have been over 200 names etched in the cement. Darth Vader, Robot C-3PO and Tom Nix's horse Flicker are the only non-humans to have their names immortalised. And if you're a movie fan, you would know most of them. It's a tourist ritual to walk down Hollywood Boulevard and read the names. Many a movie premiere has been held here, perhaps the most famous being the original Star Wars in 1977. The Chinese theatre was Sid Grumman's attempt to expand his business after opening his successful Egyptian theatre in 1922. It took him another five years to open his more oriental version, and he needed financial help to do it. Sid owned a one-third interest with his partners Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks and Howard Schenk. Pickford and Fairbanks, seen here signing a deal with, among others, Charlie Chaplin, were huge stars at the time. Hollywood was in the middle of its marvellous Dream Factory era, and Grumman's Chinese launch coincided with Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The King of Kings. Perhaps not surprisingly, the first two stars to have their names laid down in the hard concrete were Fairbanks and Pickford. During construction, Grumman specified he wanted extremely hard concrete laid in the forecourt. The exterior of the theatre resembles a giant red Chinese pagoda. Architecture features a huge Chinese dragon. Sid sold his share to William Fox's Fox Theatre in 1929, but remained managing director until his death in 1950. Since the early days, Grumman's Chinese Theatre has been home to many premieres, birthday parties, corporate junkets, and two Academy Award ceremonies. The Hollywood Dream Factory couldn't exist without the fans. We mentioned earlier that it's nearly mandatory for fans to queue for anything in Hollywood. But these Star Wars fans took it to extremes. They began queuing six weeks before the release of Star Wars V, The Return of the Sith. And what made their dedication all the more intriguing was that it had been announced that the movie premiere was to take place at another venue. We love for the people running the Chinese or whoever's in charge to actually notice that we're here a lot of us are flying in from Australia and Britain and investing a lot of time and money and we're hoping that they will see us as dedicated enough and fond enough of the Chinese theatre that they will actually show it there. In the meantime, these obsessive Star Wars fans had plenty of time to learn how to master their lightsabers and appreciate the grandeur of Grumman's Chinese theatre. Coming up, the world's youngest jockeys. You are watching living history. This is Mongolia, and the clouds of dust in the distance are horses racing. If not for the ambulance following, we could be back in the time of Genghis Khan and his feared hordes of warriors. It's said that Mongolians are born in the saddle, and not long after they are competing in races like this. But they still have to learn the basics. This is the annual Nadam Festival, a three-day sporting event that harks back to Khan's time. It showcases a competition of three manly sports, horse racing, archery and wrestling. The race is a spectacular event as hundreds of horses shoot out from amidst the dust, accompanied by wild shouts of jockeys and cheering spectators. The horse race section is a chance for jockeys to prove their prowess, which is learned from a very young age. The oldest competitor allowed here is just 12 years old. I am 12 this year, so next year is the last chance I have to race. I want to be really fast next year because I won't be able to jockey again. It's a coming-of-age ritual even though they are not old enough to come of age. 
jockeys from 5 to 12 years old gallop their horses at breakneck speeds across the plains near Ulaanbaatar. The small size of the jockeys also increases the horse's endurance. The horses are sometimes equally as young, some as young as one year. The races, which involve hundreds of competitors, are broken down into six categories based on the age of the horse. Two-year-old horses race for 16 kilometers, and seven-year-olds race for 30 kilometers. For centuries, Mongolians have relied on horses for transport, sustenance, and companionship. Even still, jockeys train for months before Nadam, and the horses are given a special diet. The winning jockey is praised with the title Tangni I, or Leader of 10,000, and the five winning horses are talked about and revered in poetry and music. Nadam is very important to Mongolians, and it is really important to me because it gives me a chance during my summer break to earn money by taking tourists around on horses. This is the only way I have to earn some cash because horses are what I understand most. The Nadam festival is something to look forward to in the beautiful summer months. Winter is altogether a different proposition. Life has been very tough for many Mongolians in recent years. The dust from the racing is the result of successive droughts, which have been disastrous for many Mongolian farmers. Skinny stock often don't survive the winters, where the temperature plummets to as low as 50 below zero, leaving many herders without a livelihood or sufficient food. A Red Cross Red Crescent assessment team recently visited various regions of Mongolia. An estimated 2.4 million animals are expected to die this winter. More than 260,000 people are expected to be affected. Serenbat, 76 years old, is one herder trying to survive the harsh winter. The summer was very hot and there were also fires. Now there is a lot of snow and no grass. The snow is melting and freezing again, and there is nothing for the cows to eat anymore. The cows are just going around trying to find grass, but there is nothing. Animals provide the Mongolians with food, transport and their livelihood. Families are being left with few supplies and little or no opportunities. The trauma to their livestock is causing many people to consider moving to urban centres. But city life is not the preferred option. Summer can't come around quickly enough. Normally, drinking beer wouldn't be considered a landmark activity. But in this case, it's where you are drinking that makes it noteworthy. The Hof Brauhaus beer cellar in Munich recently celebrated its 400th anniversary with, how else, a beer drinking celebration. The world's most famous beer cellar has been a magnet for locals and travelers from around the globe since the early 19th century. In many ways, it has symbolized Germany to the rest of the world. Beer halls are huge taverns that exist throughout the southern German cities. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of people are able to gather and engage in their favorite pastimes of drinking and talking. The Bavarian ruler, Maximilian I, built his royal Weiss beer, White Beer Brewery, in the Bavarian capital in 1607. In 1828, King Ludwig I decreed that the royal alehouse was to become a people's alehouse. Paris has the Eiffel Tower and Egypt has the pyramids and we have the most famous pub in the world. The people of Munich are proud of that and they are proud that they get to know the cultures of the visiting tourists. They all sit around a big beer table, around 10 of them, and three might be from Munich, two from Italy and two from America and they will all be trying to talk together as much as they can. The perfect example of international understanding. Beer halls have a tradition of being venues for political rallies. The combination of beer and politics has not surprisingly sometimes led to fights, even sparking a revolution, the most famous being Hitler's failed beer hall putsch, which took place in Munich at the nearby Burger Brau Keller. In 1923, 
the future dictator was building his political career and planned to launch his bid for power from Munich. He and 600 of his supporters surrounded the packed drinking room and declared a revolution had begun. The coup was directionless, however, and ended in tragedy. More than 20 people were killed and Hitler was jailed soon after. But it was while he was in prison that he perfected a plan that was to take him to power and eventually the world to war. The event became an important symbol of Nazi propaganda and was later commemorated by a stamp. Centuries ago in Bavaria, beer was not just a drink, but a basic foodstuff, and brewers at the time experimented with all kinds of ingredients, causing many hangovers and in some cases even death. This is why in 1516 the authorities issued special brewing laws, the German Beer Purity Law, which still applies today. These days the mix between people from different places creates for many a special atmosphere. We can all meet and sit around a table talking with friends, talking about God and the world, mainly about women. We have our separate tables, but sometimes we get tourists joining us, and then you learn something new or have a little joke around. That is what life is all about. While drinking beer, you must, or at least you should, have food. The Hofbrauhaus menu is based on the ancient Bavarian taste for Weisswurst, white sausages, suckling pig and pork knuckles. The brewery says that if you put all the sausages consumed there annually, end to end, the chain would be 20 kilometers long. According to legend, one of the Brauhaus guests is an angel, a regular who died and went to heaven. He missed Munich and the brewery so much that God took mercy and sent him back on a mission. Aloysius the angel forgot the mission, but not the beer and stayed. So there is, for beer drinkers at least, a heaven on earth.